Good morning. You're very welcome to today's webinar. Um, okay, we've just completed a sound check with a few people who logged on early. So let's get started. Do let me know if you're having any um, sound issues though. Throughout the webinar, please type in any questions you may have into the question tab on your control panel and we will have a Q&A session after our panel discussion today. Today's session is being recorded and we will email everyone a copy of the recording if you need to pop off for any reason. After today's webinar, we will run a one minute survey at the end, so if you could fill that out just to give us some feedback on how you found today. We have designed today's webinar to give you an understanding of how PAYE modernization will affect your business and what impact it will have on running of your payroll. PAYE modernization will involve the most significant reform of the PAYE system since its introduction in 1960. Employers will need to calculate and report their employees' pay and deductions as they are being paid. This will make it easier for revenue, employers and employees to ensure that the right tax is deducted and paid at the right time. We have three speakers presenting today's webinar. First up, we have our main speaker, Paul Byrne, who is the Managing Director at Thesaurus and BrightPay. After qualifying as a chartered accountant, Paul went on to set up and manage his own accounting practice. Paul co-founded Thesaurus Software in 1991 with the goal of providing payroll software to Irish businesses. Thesaurus Software now provides quality software products and excellent customer service to over 100,000 businesses across the UK and Ireland. So welcome, Paul. Next up, I'm delighted to welcome Sandra Clark, who is a partner at BCC Accountants and a council member of the Irish Tax Institute. Sandra is on the front line when it comes to helping her clients through the new PAYE modernization changes. Sandra will be joining us for our panel discussion. So welcome, Sandra. We are delighted to welcome our next guest speaker, Sinead Sweeney, who is the PAYE Modernization Change Manager for the Revenue Commissioners. Sinead is, Sinead is very much on the front line when it comes to PAYE modernization and will also deliver a presentation today from Revenue's perspective. So welcome Sinead. For our panel discussion and Q&A session, we'll have Paul, Sandra and Sinead. We will also be joined by Audrey Mooney, who is the support manager at the Sora Software and holds various qualifications in payroll management. We will also be joined by Victoria Clark, another one of our support managers, who will take us through what PAYE modernization looks like in the UK. So welcome Audrey and Vicky. So I'll now pass it over to Paul Byrne to begin today's webinar. So thank you, Paul. Take it away there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Karen. Okay. Uh, this is the, the agenda that's on screen there at the moment. So we've a bit to get through. Uh, so I'll, I'll crack right into it now uh, with an introduction. Um, first of all, we're going to do how will PUI modernization affect your payroll processes. That's the part one of this, of this webinar. And part two is the actual revenue presentation. And then we'll have questions and answers. Okay, so what is PUI modernization? As, as Karen said, it's real-time reporting and it's probably the biggest overhaul of the PUI system since PUI was introduced back in 1960. So just to mention to, to for any of you who are on our previous PUI modernization webinars, there will be some duplicate content to what you heard on the last webinar, but I have tried to keep the duplicate material to a minimum. So for those who have previously tuned in, this is both a refresher and an update. So. Currently, lots of employees are being given the wrong tax credits and cut-off points, and this is because revenue only gets payroll data once a year in the form of the P35. Receiving the data in real time would ensure that revenue can allocate the correct credits, thereby avoiding any over or under payments of tax. Revenue will know what the tax, or sorry, where the taxpayer is working and how much they are earning. Many employers are not operating PUI correctly in that they don't register new employees or they use out-of-date tax credits. This is also addressed by PUI modernization. So essentially a file, much akin to a P35 or a mini P35 as they often refer to it, will be submitted electronically to revenue on or before each pay run. 
In most cases, this means a file is submitted either weekly or monthly. Also, the retrieval of tax credits will be automated, which should ensure that the correct credits are being applied by employers. At the end of a tax year, the individual taxpayer will be able to view and print their official certificate of earnings and deductions directly from their, their, their portal. This means that P60s will no longer be required. The files being submitted to each pay run will have details of employees commencing and employees leaving. And this will mean that P45s and P46s are no longer required to be completed by the employer. And as revenue will be receiving file submissions each pay period, the annual P35 will no longer be required. In addition, the periodic file will eliminate the need for P30s. So, as the, the, the heading says there, there's no more P forms. We'll have a look at some of the file specifications or what's or some of the highlights or the headline items of the file specifications. Um, the new files, the, the first one is called the Revenue Payroll Notification, or RPN for short. And this is used to retrieve the tax credits and cutoff points for new and existing employees. This is this basically is the same thing as the P2C, the current P2C request. And there's also the payroll submission request, also known as the PSOR, and this will be used to, to submit the payroll data to revenue each pay period. The full file specifications are, in, are included on the links there on the screen, and we also have included them in the handout section on your control panel if you wish to download them. So, uh, one of the, uh, the, the key items that's, that's not actually in the RPN, which is effectively, as I say, the P2C file, um, is illness benefit. And illness benefit will, will no longer be notified to employers by revenue, as revenue will now adjust an employee's tax credits and cutoff points instead. <clears throat> so, this means that payroll operators will no longer need to worry about taxing illness benefit. The only downside to this is that many company sick pay schemes require details of the amounts being paid by DSP. These details will now only be available from the employees themselves, which may or may not be sufficient proof for the relevant schemes. So accordingly, employers may need to review their staff handbooks and policies for this new regime. Employees will be able to log on to their My Welfare account and get print as a illness benefit received, so this might also be an option for those sick pay schemes. As I said, even though uh, PO modernization <coughs> is something that applies from uh, next January 2019, uh, that change regarding illness benefit is effective now. <clears throat> On the, the periodic uh, month or weekly or monthly return, uh, one of the items that's going to be included is employment ID. And this is, this is possibly not relevant to 99% of employees. The 1% that it is relevant to are those employees who have multiple employments with the same employer and those employees who cease with an employer and are then re-employed by the same employer in the same tax year. So the purpose of the employment ID is to distinguish these employments from each other so as to ensure that the employee's tax credits and cutoffs are allocated correctly. In other words, they're not duplicated across the, the various employments. One of the problems at the moment is that some of these employees are receiving their full tax credits and cutoffs in each employment, meaning that they are not paying enough tax. So the payroll software will handle these IDs in the background, but you, you will also have some capability of, of amending them. The, the payroll submission request, is, say, which is the periodic return, um, I will refer to this elsewhere in, the, in, in this webinar as, a, say, a mini P35. Another item, or one of the items that this will need to include on it is the RPN number. So, in other words, when uh, you receive, basically when you retrieve the tax credit and cut off information from revenue in the form of the RPN, that comes back to you with a reference number. And that same reference number must then be included in the periodic return which is sent with all the payroll data and this basically proves that you are using the most recent tax credit instruction issued by revenue. Another item in the periodic return is gross medical insurance that is paid by the employer. 
at, at the moment, the current P35, it looks for the amount of medical insurance eligible for tax relief. Fortunately, it is not this amount that has been looked for on the, the, the new periodic return. It will just be the amount that is actually paid, the amount, in other words, that gives rise to a BIK a liability. Um, another item that's included on the periodic return is the expected number of pay periods in a full year. The, this, the file specification for the periodic return states that this is used to determine whether a week one or cumulative RPN should be provided when an employee moves jobs or pay frequencies. Now I'm going to have a bit of uh, the conspiracy theory here and I think this same information uh, could be used by revenue to make considerable savings on what week 53 currently costs them. At present, if there are 53 paydays in a tax year, the employee gets an additional week's tax credits and cutoffs in that week 53. So from 2019, the software and employer will, will need to know from the start of the year how many paydays there are going to be in that year. So if there are 53, then the year's tax credits and cutoffs may be spread over the 53 weeks as against being spread over 52 weeks at present with an additional week being given in week 53. So, so at the moment, that's me and my conspiracy theories. So what direct effect will, will this have on employers? So instead of, okay, instead of a yearly P35, there will be, as, I, as I've mentioned, a mini P35, also known as the PSR, uh, submitted with each payroll run. The employer will be required to check for updated tax credits and cutoff points as part of the, of the weekly or monthly payroll process. So it'll be an integral part of each payroll run. Details of employees starting and employees leaving will also be included in that mini P35, so to speak. Then, businesses across Ireland have broadly welcomed the, the introduction of real-time reporting. I, I suppose it, it does, as I'll cover a little bit later on, for employers that, say, do things, I suppose, the way they should be done, where they, they're paying their employees weekly or monthly and they're, you know, they're, they're calculating the correct deductions, etc., it'll actually probably represent a saving in time, this new system for them. Um, it's only really those employees or sorry employers who uh, are currently doing things manually or maybe there's a lot of cash in hand or things like that going on that this will will represent something new and something uh, that will need to be learned and changed for um, but in it in, in overall purposes for most employers it will streamline their business processes and reduce their administrative costs Employees, things change there as well. Employees will be able under the new system to log into revenue in, with their My Account and view what has been submitted in relation to them by the employer. So if effectively they'll be able to see like a, a revenues version of a, of a pay slip. It won't actually be a pay slip, but more like a pay and deduction statement. Employees will be able to allocate their credits and cutoffs between multiple employments, again using their My Account uh, facility in revenue. Revenue can be informed of changes in employment as well. And at the year end, employees will be able to view and print their official certificate of earnings and deductions. And if, for, for example, they're going for mortgages or loans or whatever, this, this will be the, the type of documentation that the banks will now look for. So possible downsides for employers. Um, Smaller businesses have expressed concern about the administrative burden of the new regime, particularly those in areas with poor internet access. Now, I actually disagree with that because I think most of them will, be, will find that the new system will, will actually be easier. And again, I, I, I'll cover that in another slide. Um, th th there will be less manual sort of work. Even though software does look after an awful lot of things, there's still a lot of manual process within the software itself. And, and those particular manual processes will be no more with, with the, new, the new system. Um, yeah, poor internet access is, is, is obviously an issue in, in, in some areas. Employers who are not using software will need to invest in a payroll solution that will cater for the needs of payroll modernization. Okay, that is a downside, but fortunately, most payroll software available uh, for small businesses is, is quite uh, cost effective. 
<coughs> I personally feel the time-saving benefits of payroll software should outweigh the fi any financial investment. So where did the time-saving benefits come from? Well, they come as a result of APIs in the payroll software. An API stands for Application Programming Interface, and this enables different software applications to communicate with each other. In our case, it allows our payroll software to directly interact with revenue systems. So instead of the very manual routines of downloading or uploading, selecting file locations, logging in screens, etc., there would hopefully be just one submit button to replace all of this. For example, <clears throat> look at how tax credits, in other words P2Cs, are retrieved at present. You log into your Ross account, you go to the Revenue Record tab, you then select P2C, P2C details, you then search the relevant tax year, then you export, which involves choosing where to save to, then in your payroll software you go to the relevant P2C import section, you need to select the correct file from the correct location and then import. By my count, there, there are nearly 10 steps involved in that process. With the API, it should just be one click to achieve, to achieve all of this. Similarly, with the periodic payroll submission, or what I sometimes refer to as the mini P35, uh, the actual transfer of this data to revenue will also be a one click process. Because of the APIs for, say, the P2C retrievals and file submissions, the actual work each pay period should be less than it is at present. So just looking at a typical pay period and the sequence of payroll events which you know should happen, firstly you enter the details of new employees into the payroll, then you enter their hours and pay and deductions, then you retrieve the latest uh, tax credit information and say this will be a one-click process because of the API, then you process and finalize the payroll, then you submit the file to revenue and again this is just a one-click process and finally you distribute the pay slips and pay your employees. We are hoping that the responses to the API requests will be answered in seconds by revenue systems. This is something we feel is important to the user experience. In the UK, where they have a similar system, the response is usually, it usually comes within 10 seconds. It should be noted that the, IP, or sorry, the APIs uh, will use the employer's or agent's digital certificates, and this cert will need to have been installed on the computer. If the user can log into ROS on the computer, then it has the cert installed. The file specifications for the, uh, the P2C request, which we now call the RPN, and the payroll submission request, which is the, basically the mini P35, were both published on the 30th of June 2017. And this, this was after a period of fairly intense consultation with payroll software developers and other stakeholders, for example, it, Chartered Accountants Ireland and the Irish Tax Institute and so on. The next revenue deadline is for the provision of a test environment which revenue plan to have in place by the end of March 2018. So this will allow us software developers to test file submissions and responses in real time. It's also a good opportunity for revenue to test their own systems. As developers, we have to ensure that programming for the APIs and file creation routines are finished before the next budget, which will be announced next October. We will concentrate on programming for and testing the budget changes after that date. Uh, so our software will be hopefully available for release mid-December 2018. The, two, the 2018 P35s will still need to be submitted by mid-February 2019. So effectively this means that the, the old and the new systems overlap at the start of 2019. So we are now going to give you a quick uh, five-minute demo, uh, maybe even less than that, of the, the, the real-time information features in our UK software, which shows you how it works there and gives you a flavour, really, of how it will work in Ireland. And just to note uh, that our software in the UK is called BrightPay. In Ireland, we have two payroll software solutions. We have both the Source Payroll Manager and we have BrightPay, and both of our Irish products will handle POI modernization. In this, uh, in this demonstration, we will look at the retrieving of the coding notices, which is basically the same as the retrieval of the RPN on the, on the Irish system, look at finalizing the payroll, 
and we look for, at it submitting an FPS, which is basically the same as uh, the new payroll submission request or the PSR. So take it away there, uh, Vicky. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Paul. So good morning, everybody. So I just have a series of demo slides to show you, which will just demonstrate how the process works in the UK system. <coughs> Excuse me. So real-time reporting has been in the UK since 2013. Um, so just what I'll show you now may just give you an idea of what to expect in 2019 here in Ireland. So you'll see here that I'm just in my payroll utility here in my BrightPay UK software. So my first task every pay period is to first check to see if there's been any changes in my employees' tax-free allowance, their tax basis, or if there's any previous employment history to bring in for them. And this is done by simply clicking on the coding notice option on the menu bar here and clicking check for notices. Okay, so this will log into the HMRC's website, the UK Revenue Authority there. If there are any changes to be implemented in this pay periods payroll, um, all I need to do is just select the employee. You'll see here that I have a change in the tax code here, so I'm just going to tick the employee, and I select the option to apply selected. Okay, and that will then make the change in, my, in the payroll for me. Any changes that I do implement, um, there is history um, here for me, so I can pop into this utility at any time and just, you know, have a, a record of the changes that I've made. Okay. If I just return to the payroll screen then, and just select that employee for whom there was a change, and you'll see here that there was a change in their tax code, and that's been impl implemented from this pay period onwards. Okay, so as Paul mentioned, we, we envisage that um, the process I've just shown you there, that the revenue payroll notification process in Ireland will very much follow these, um, these steps there. Okay, so every time an employee is paid in the UK, uh, the employer is required to submit what is known as a full payment submission, or what they refer to as FPS for short, and that needs to be submitted on or before each payday to HMRC, the UK Revenue Authority. And this FPS is used to inform HMRC about payments made to every employee and all the associated deductions made. And it's also used to report as well new starters and leavers. So the payroll submission request that, again, Paul has spoken about already will very much be the equivalent of the full payment submission in the UK system. So to generate and submit the full payment submission um, in the UK system, my next step then is just to process my payroll as normal. Then when I'm ready and I'm happy, I'm going to click on finalize pay slips. You'll see here that I've also got an employee who's leaving, and I'm going to click on OK here to finalize the pay period. As soon as the pay period is finalized, the BrightPay software then automatically creates the full payment submission for me, and you'll now see that the number one has appeared next to my RTI utility, and that's now to tell me that that um, submission is now ready um, to go off to HMRC, so I'm just going to click into there. Here you'll see my submission here in my listing, I'm going to select it, and um, in a readable format here on the screen for me, I can see the details of every employee and all their pay information, and that's just going to tell me what's going to go off to HMRC there, okay? You'll see here as well my lever, um, his leave date is clearly shown as well, and that's going to go off in the submission as well. So when ready, I simply click on send now. And when it is successfully, successfully received and accepted by HMRC, I get confirmation on screen there as well. Okay. So if I just return back to my payroll utility, so that process I'm going to repeat every pay period. So it's very, very seamless. In the event that you've made your submission and you subsequently need to make a correction, they are handled as well quite seamlessly in the software. All you need to do is select the employee for whom you wish to make a change, click on reopen payslips, okay, and reopen the payslip there, make the change, then finalize that employee's payslip again, okay. And then you're ready then to communicate that change um, to HMRC again. And again, that, communica sorry, that, that communication is done through a further submission. So I'm just going to click back into my RTI utility here, click on new, and then what, what's it, in the UK it's known as an additional FPS, and this is used to report corrections. 
OK, I select the employee, click on OK, and again, I just send that off <laughs> to HMRC there. So very, very seamless. So I will now pass you back to Paul. He's just going to talk more about making corrections. OK, thank you very much for that, Vicky. Just one of the things I, I noticed there when we're actually doing the retrieval coding notices, um, <coughs> we may end up doing that slightly different, I think, in Ireland, because there were, there were a few clicks involved in that in that process. I noticed that from your, your demonstration there, in that, uh, you know, you, you, were, you were showing who the change is related to, and then you actually had to physically sort of Select. take them and, and import. It might be a little bit more automated in that it will just apply the, the changes automatically, but it would also tell you that the change, who, who it has been applied to. Um, one of the other things that struck me as well, looking at the, the UK demo there, is that one of the things they have in the UK now is auto enrollment, and they've had it there for the last few years. It's been been rolling out over the last few years, um, and that is planned uh, for Ireland as well. Uh, I think they're hoping they're hoping to have it for I don't know 2020, 21, or whatever. Um, but that that is a, a big part of the UK payroll process as well. That, that wasn't included in that in that particular company, which Vicky showed you there. But that's another uh, complication. But it's very automated as well. Um, the other thing we do as well is we uh, we provide facilities for batching uh, of the of the of the actual submissions. But that's more applicable to I suppose to bureau uh, situ setups. Um, sorry, I'm just looking to see where my mouse has gone. <laughs> oh, there it is. Um, okay, so just looking at deadlines and, and corrections. In the UK, uh, the, the FPS, as it's called, uh, must be submitted on or before the actual payday. And in Ireland, uh, the recent Finance Act confirmed that it will be the same. So in my view, it'll probably be easier to just submit after finalising each payroll. In much the same way in, in the, as in the UK, the UK demo we just showed you. At least you will know the payroll is done and dusted when you close out of it. I myself, I run a couple of UK payrolls and I've gotten into the habit of sending the FPS straight after I finalise the payroll each pay period and that's even before say the employees are paid. If a submission is incorrect, a correction submission can be made by the software. If the correction means that more tax is payable for a previous tax month, revenue may also apply interest. Also a correction after the month's close off or sign off date, say after the 23rd of the following month, this will be seen as a change to a statutory declaration. If there's a constant pattern of corrections uh, or there's a pattern of late submissions, revenue may take, it may come on the radar uh, and so they may take corrective actions such as uh, site visits or audits or whatever. Just to, to see how corrections are actually dealt with, uh, they're dealt with on the basis of what what I call or what revenue called follow follow the money. If an employee is over or underpaid in a period and their pay is adjusted in the next period to correct this, well, there's no, there's no correction submission required in that case because the actual the payroll is actually reflecting what was actually paid. However, if a, if an employee is paid an amount different to what it says in the payroll then a correction submission will, will subsequently be required. So, you know, if it's a case that you're, you're paying people cash in hand or whatever, and then you find out later that, well, you know, you need to, to adjust uh, their growth because the tax credits were different at that time or whatever, um, that will require a correction submission. In, it, from, uh, I think it's July onwards, uh, payroll software will prepare a return, much like an employee register, uh, for submitting electronically to revenue. And I'd say from July onwards, this this will be sought by revenue, and I think through the ROS, when you log into ROS, uh, a notification will come up looking for this this information or this this return. Um, and this, this, this will enable revenue to have accurate information uh, for when the new system starts in 2019 so they can so their initial issue of tax credits and cutoff points would be as accurate as, as possible. I'm going to look at disputed liabilities. 
uh, because we've had some experience of this in the UK and, and, and one of the main shortcomings in the UK system is the difficulty in rec reconciling taxes owed where HMRC's figures are different to what the payroll says is outstanding. And these differences are usually due to HMRC duplicating employments where they receive more than one employment ID for the same employee. And this can happen quite easily when employees are moving from one system to another, or sorry, when, they're, when they've been migrated from one system to another. Unfortunately, with the UK system, there's no facility to query or drill down into their figures. I know it's something they're actually looking at, uh, correcting there, but they don't have it at the moment. One of the features of the new Irish system will be an API where, whereby the payroll can query data submitted so that the payroll can then perform a reconciliation between this data and what it has on file. Such an API may also be useful where employers change their payroll software mid-year or move from a manual system mid-year. Yeah, I just want to look at, um, say, for any employers out there that are currently uh, doing their payroll manually. And I think manually might be the wrong word for it. I'd say what some of them do is they might download, uh, say, trial payroll software at the beginning of a year. They see how much the deduction is in that trial period, and they'll just continue taking that deduction for the remainder of the year. Revenue at the currently estimated a bit, there's about 60,000 uh, employers who uh, call themselves manual. And I think where they glean that information from or why, why they categorize them as manual is that they do a Ross uh, offline application P35 at the end of the year and they submit that through, through Ross rather than as say, a pre-prepared uh, file which would be created by payroll software. Under the new system, those employers will still be able to calculate the payroll manually. However, in each pay period, uh, be it weekly or monthly, they will need to log into Ross and enter all the required details for all of their employees. And they'll be a bit like manually completing a P35 each pay period. And this facility in Ross will only, will only be available for employers with five or less employees. Also, before processing the payroll in any week, they will need to religiously log into Ross to get details of tax credits and cutoff points. And this again will be a very manual process and prone to error. So for these employers, for their sanity alone, never mind the huge time savings, it should become apparent that they should either be using the services of a payroll bureau or that they should be using payroll software. And obviously our hope is that they'll opt for the payroll software option. So and just probably a quick summary of why employers need to get things right. <clears throat> Firstly, under this new system, employees logging into their My Account will expect to see their most recent payments and for these details to be correct. So they will be checking in, in themselves from time to time. Late periodic submissions will potentially give rise to interest and or penalties. Plus the employer may, well probably will, come on under the revenue risk analysis profiles. A constant pattern of correction submissions will potentially give rise to interest and or penalties plus the employer will come within revenues risk analysis profiles. Because the, the, the reference number of the latest RPN, which is the, uh, the submission that, that you get for the new tax credits and, or the latest tax credits and cutoffs, because that is included on the periodic submission, revenue will auto automatically know when RPN checking and processing is not happening. So there's a lot of checks if externally going on there to see whether the employer is doing things the way they should be doing. Um, so as I say, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons to, to, to do it right from, from next January anyway. Okay, uh, so I'll just pass you back to, to Vicky here. The <laughs> Many thanks, Paul. So we're just ready now to, um, to shortly pass over to Sinead. Um, just while we have your undivided attention, just while we get Sinead, um, Sinead's slides ready, we just have a cheeky one-minute sales pitch, if, if you don't mind there. Um, so in today's webinar, we showed you BrightPay, our UK payroll software, which was just used to give you an insight into how POE modernization or real-time reporting, as it's known there, works in the UK. 
As Paul mentioned earlier, both the Source Peril Manager and BrightPay Island um, will also be able to seamlessly handle POA modernization in 2019 and onwards. So having done it already in the UK, we do have the, ex the experience and expertise. Um, on the screen now you can just see that we have information about, about BrightPay Island. So the employer version of BrightPay here in Ireland handles an unlimited number of employees and is priced at €149 Euro plus VAT, and that's per tax year. And there will be no additional charges for implementing POIE modernization next year. BrightPay has many useful features to help with the administration of your payroll processing. For example, you can roll back individual employees, you can create your own custom reports, and payroll journal exports are also available to the likes of Xero, Sage, and QuickBooks. Plus, we have an optional online backup add-on called BrightPay Connect, which includes an employee self-service um, for employees to be able to access pay slips and request leave. And also, it consists of an employer portal where you can view all your employees' leave, pay slips, and payroll reports. BrightPay as well also allows you to migrate from the likes of Sage and CallSoft and the Big Red Book. Um, so you can hit the ground running in 2018 knowing that you are using the right software well in time for the introduction of POE modernization. Um, Sorry. So, um, if you do um, wish to receive any more information about um, BrightPay, do give our team a call there. And also, as well, if you're thinking of migrating to us, um, our support team are here to help with any problems switching over. So, we're just going to just show you briefly um, how BrightPay Connect works, just while we get Sinead set up here. Welcome to BrightPay Connect, our latest cloud add-on that works alongside BrightPay Payroll. With BrightPay Connect, you can automatically store payroll information in the cloud and enable online access anywhere, anytime for you, your accountant and your employees. You'll be up and running in seconds. Secure online backup. Automatically synchronize and backup data to the cloud, protecting against ransomware and cyber attacks. Employer dashboard. Get online access to your payroll information. Invite your accountant to instantly access your payroll data 24-7. Access all employees' payslips, payroll reports, annual leave requests, amounts due to revenue, and employee documents. Employee self-service portal. Invite employees to their own online portal. Employees can view and download payslips, P60s, and P45s. Easily submit holiday requests. View leave taken and leave remaining. HR and annual leave management. View all upcoming leave in the BrightPay Connect company-wide calendar. Authorize leave requests with changes automatically flowing back to the payroll. Upload HR documents, including employee contracts and handbooks. Book a demo today to see how BrightPay Connect can meet your payroll and HR needs. Uh, good morning everybody. Um, as Paul said, my name is Sinead Sweeney and I'm the change manager for the PAYE modernization project on behalf of the revenue commissioners. So I suppose what I'd like to do today is continue on in terms of what Paul has already presented to you, but to bring you this more or less a lot of the information, but from the revenue perspective and how it's going to affect you in terms of your day-to-day -day operations. Um, I suppose for um, we're just getting the slides ready there. I suppose just to give you an overview in terms of why we're actually doing this and a lot of the reasons why we've decided to modernise the existing PAYE system. As Paul already mentioned, the system that we currently have has been with us since the 1960s and really very little has changed in terms of how we actually operate the system, how we administer and collect the tax. But all around us, everything else has changed dramatically. And I suppose particularly uh, the nature of how people are currently employed be they you know, no longer working in one job for life where their tax credits and rate bans just change with budgetary changes each year. You now have people who are employed across several employments working for several multiple employers at the same time but also working uh, several contracts possibly for one overall employer 
and all of that information needs to be accounted for correctly in terms of how their credits and rate bands are allocated to ensure that they are maximising their entitlements right across all of their employments. Payroll has changed significantly since the 1960s from a period where a lot of the information would have been worked out manually. We now have sophisticated payroll systems that uh, manage a lot of the computations and calculations for employers. And all of this has been aided and assisted by the ever-changing uh, technological advancements that we have, which now allow us to have a real-time reporting system and where it can be operated um, using our technological um, systems. It also allows us to um, give employees and employers the ability to view their information in a real-time way and people now expect to be able to do that as we're all living in an e-enabled environment and most of us carry out our day-to-day -day business and personal transactions um, in an e in an e-environment. So I suppose to, to assist with that, we have now um, made that available for individuals to be able to actually view their tax deductions. We would see three main beneficiaries in terms of the actual new system. So the employer, who really we would see as being benefiting by reducing their administrative burden. And we know currently that employers have to manage a significant amount of admin that really is of no benefit to them. And it's forms that are required um, on behalf of the employees, but that revenue required them to complete. So we're abolishing all of those forms. So the P30s, the P45s, P46s, P60 and the end of year return will be gone from the 1st of the 1st, 2019. And this should help employers to minimise their costs to comply and it will also allow for seamless integration into their payroll systems. The ultimate benefit is that the right tax will be paid on the current due dates and we're not changing the dates for when tax is due to be paid. And ultimately this should result in time savings for the employer. For the employee then, they will have access to simplified online services. So they'll now be able to view their information literally as it happens. So when the employer has returned the information to revenue, the employee will be able to log on and actually see what has been paid over and deducted on their behalf. And this is a level of transparency that heretofore the employee didn't have. And they would regularly ring um, the PAYE 1890 helpline with a query in relation to their payslip. And they're surprised that the individual on the end of the phone doesn't have that information in front of them to be able to effectively answer their query. But now Revenue will have that information and they will be able to deal with employees' queries in a more effective uh, way. For ourselves then in Revenue, there's going to be a statutory in-year employer return. So that will be a monthly return. It will make compliance easier from our perspective as we will be immediately able to see where somebody hasn't filed their return or where they haven't actually paid over the liability for that period. We will have accurate up-to-date income details for all employees and over time this should reduce customer contacts as people become more familiar with using the online systems and being able to manage their own tax affairs more effectively. It will also allow us to carry out more timely targeted interventions and certainly from our analysis to date when companies are in difficulty it seems to be that the payroll is an area that suffers where they either discontinue paying the staff altogether or they move the staff off the payroll and pay them in cash and now we will be able to have sight of these types of changes in payroll history and we will be able to intervene much earlier to ensure that the employees rights are protected at all times. In terms then of giving you some context in, um, as to what we're currently dealing with and how we're currently managing and processing the PAYE um, requirements, we have 2.7 million active employments and that includes people who are in receipt of pensions. We have about 206,000 employees registered with us that currently show they have more than one live employment and certainly there are multiple employments with the same employers registered on our systems as well. We have 208,000 registered employers and as Paul already mentioned, 110,000 of those um, employers have less than five employees and 98% of those have filed uh, their information using ROS. 
there's a significant amount of form processing and forms generated in order to fulfil employer uh, PAYE reporting obligations and for uh, 2016, which is the most up-to-date information I have at the moment, there were over 5.4 million forms generated in order to fulfil those requirements. I suppose just to remind people of their current employments, uh, their current obligations should I say, um, every time an employer pays an employee they must apply the latest P2C, they must calculate the tax to be deducted and provide that employee with a payslip that clearly shows those pay and deductions that have been made on their behalf. In terms of the revenue reporting obligations, the employer is required to file a P45 or a P46 every time an employee starts or leaves employment with them. Then every month or every quarter, they must submit a P30 and the relevant payment for that period. And then by February of the following year, they must complete the P35 with the associated listings for each of their employees. So that's the current process and it will be the process for 2018. So as Paul already mentioned, there will be a period of overlap for 2018 into 2019. In terms of how we view this process, and I suppose as an employer you'll have your list of employees to be paid, you will go onto your payroll software and you will be able to access the latest revenue payroll notifications. You'll then be able to perform the calculations as you would normally, finalise your payroll, send that file for processing to the bank, create your payslips and at the same time a report of that transaction will be filed with revenue. The employee will then still receive their pay as normal, receive their payslip but they will now be able to see their pay and tax deductions in the jobs and pensions module on uh, revenue.ie. So in order to get rid of the P30 requirements, what will happen is if we take somebody that is a weekly um, payer, they will send us their weekly payroll at the end of the month. We will summarise that and send them um, a bill based on their total tax submissions. They will then have an opportunity to review that statement and if it's correct, they'll be presented with an option to actually indicate that they're happy with the statement or if they don't uh, contact us at all, we will deem that statement as their return. They also at this time have an opportunity to make any corrections. Maybe something has happened in one of the previous payroll periods that they now need to correct and this is the time to correct that. The payments will be made in line with the current payment dates but it will allow us to intervene much earlier where there are debt management issues for any underpayments that arise in year. And then all of the interventions uh, that we will carry out will be based on a risk analysis of what has actually been reported to revenue. In terms then of the P45 and P46 process, so when you have a new employee commencing with you, you will simply go onto your payroll system and insert a commencement date for that employee. That will then allow you to access the latest revenue payroll notifications and run your payroll as normal without having to wait for a P45 to come in from the previous employer of that employee. When somebody is leaving your employment then you will simply again go onto your payroll system and insert a cessation date for that individual. And when that payroll is notified to revenue we will then be able to see that that person is no longer working for you. The individual can also go on <clears throat> to the Jobs and Pension Service and register their own employment if they so desire to. In terms of the P60, and I suppose this is a significant change for a lot of employers and employees, the P60 is something that issues on an annual basis and people actually do like to receive the P60. It gives them the information in respect of their pay and tax for the previous year. Most of the time they don't actually have any purpose for that P60, but it's, it is a piece of information that they like to receive. There is going forward no obligation on the employer to provide this information and the individual will now be able to go on to my account and review what will be called their end of year statement. And they'll be able to print this down and provide it to any sort of banks or lending institutions or the HSE 
or any uh, department or government body that may require a P60 for any purpose. And that will be accepted by those and we will be engaging with all of those institutions to ensure that they're aware of the changes that are coming down the line. In terms of the end of year process, I suppose this is a pretty significant change because we know a lot of employers focus on an end of year process and the P35 has afforded them the opportunity to correct information that maybe they haven't been able to capture during the year or where something now needs to be corrected. This is now gone and every month is now a statutory return. So really the end of year process is eliminated and the return that they will be filing in December will be, same, will be the same as the return that they're filing in March. So there isn't an opportunity to capture things as they have done previously and that's something that needs to be borne in mind now and to ensure that processes are put in place that the information that's going to be returned on a monthly basis will be accurate and timely. Um, Again, it will allow us to debt manage for underpayments and again, it means that we'll be able to intervene on a monthly basis. So I suppose just in terms of what's currently required where you're running a payroll, and this I suppose is in very basic terms, but really the yellow is where somebody would have to log into their payroll, set up an employee, export their P45. They then have to go log into Ross, upload the P45, wait for the next day to get an email confirmation, then log into Ross, download the P2C, log into their payroll system, upload the P2C and run the payroll. So that's currently what happens where you have somebody new or where you're about to run your payroll. Then quarterly, you have to log into the payroll, download a P30, log into Ross, upload the P30, pay the P30, wait for the next day, get your email, log back into Ross and get your receipt. And then yearly, you've got to log into the payroll, download the P35, publish the P60s, again, log into Ross and upload the P35. So there's quite an amount of logging in and uploading that's required. In the new system, what we hope to achieve is that basically you will, when you go to run your payroll, you'll log into your payroll, you'll enter, enter a commencement date or a cessation date for your employee and run your payroll. Then there is the option monthly to go in look at your statement, accept the statement. If you don't do that, we'll deem it as your return anyway. And then quarterly, you log into Ross, make your payment, you get your email, you log into Ross, get your receipt. Or you have the options to use direct debit or variable direct debit setup. In order to do all of this, we've had to change and adapt the existing legislation. And that legislation has now been enacted and it was signed into law on Christmas Day by the President. Um, I suppose just to give you a flavour of the items that are covered by that legislation. So the tax deduction card that we currently know as the P2C has now been replaced with what will be known as the Revenue Payroll Notification, so an RPN in the new system. The time frame for when an employer must notify revenue of, the of when they're actually making a, a payment to an employee has also been stitched into the legislation. So you're required to notify revenue on or before making a payment to an employee. And that notification must include the amount of emoluments, the date of payment and the amount of income tax deductible or repayable. The monthly statement is also covered by legislation and that will be issued to employers and it will contain the total income tax, USE, PRSI and LPT that should be deducted or repaid by the employer for that period. The monthly return due date is the 14th of the following month and the statement will be deemed, as I said, as the return if the employer doesn't engage with us. However, they do have the opportunity to make a correction and that's where they must go in and correct the underlying payroll data. The tax must be paid by the 14th of the following month or the 23rd where the person is paying and filing online and the Collector, Gen Collector General does have the power to vary that payment date to take account of quarterly and annual filers. There are standard rules and we will be applying those who for those who cannot file by electronic means. So we currently have about over a thousand people who have an exemption from electronic filing and they will continue to be able to avail of that exemption. We've also built in provisions to be able to deal with specific situations where employers may not be able to comply with the legislation because of a persistent technology or 
internet or electricity failure. So for instance, the likes of our recent um, events with Storm Ophelia, where people were without power for several days, and those days happened to be when they were due to file their returns. There wouldn't be any penalties for the non-compliance at that period of time. A direct debit facility will continue to be available and we've also built in the option to avail of a variable direct debit and again that has come to us from our workshops with the various employers and representative bodies that we've engaged in over the last year. So there will be an option to pay just what is due on the statement on a monthly basis. We've also changed the provision for revenue to be actually able to raise an assessment um, where there is maybe a dispute in relation to the amount of PAYE that's due to be paid over. And we can now raise an assessment for an income tax month or for several uh, consecutive months. So previously, if you were um, under a revenue audit, the revenue auditors would raise an estimate probably for a yearly period or possibly two to three years period, but now we can actually raise it for a monthly period. Um, there's also revised provisions for emergency tax and it's vitally important that they always, the employer always requests an RPN for any staff and really the only time that somebody should be on emergency is where they don't have a PPSN or where they haven't yet registered for PAYE. The basis of assessment under Schedule E is also changing from an earnings basis to a receipts basis and this is effective from the 1st of January 2018 but proprietary directors and all DEASP payments, their social protection payments, will remain on an earned basis. If PAYE is not withheld by employers on emoluments, we've also built in a facility to gross up the tax that should have been deducted. There are exclusions to this for people who are availing of uh, vouchers under Section 112B of the legislation and also for payments that are made under PAYE settlement agreements under the end of year minor and irregular 985B settlements as they're known as. In terms of stakeholder engagement, and certainly we've been out there engaging with employers and representative bodies since uh, last January quite extensively. And it certainly has been um, very evident to us that employers focus on the end of year reporting processes. And really these practices are not fully in line with PAYE regulations and they now will no longer be able to operate in that manner. It's also important to bear in mind that the real-time reporting regime will make all of these processes very visible both to revenue and also to the employees and as such business processes that are supporting these will need to change and they need to be reviewed now rather than when the system goes live in 1119. We have built in, as, we, as both myself and Paul have mentioned, a facility to be able to correct errors. And again, it must be noted that every effort should be made to ensure that submissions to revenue are accurate and timely. And as Paul mentioned, continued corrections will push the employers into an area whereby revenue interventions will probably follow suit. Not in the initial stages because obviously we know the system needs to bed down, but over time if there are continuous corrections being submitted, it will involve a revenue intervention to see what's going on in the background, why is uh, the corrections process being used um, so extensively. Um, in terms of employer readiness, we have been contacting um, employers who, based on their uh, 2016 P35, didn't inform revenue of employees that had been in their employment. Um, 32,000 letters have already issued to employers, and if you have received one of those, we would ask you to act on the instructions that have been issued with that letter. Um, if you need to check if you've received one of those, it'll be in your Ross inbox under the PAYE EMP P35L review heading. And I would certainly urge people to follow those. Um, we will be following up with those that haven't reacted to those letters and there will be revenue interventions to make sure that the processes have been followed. As Paul mentioned, we're going to be requesting all employers to submit an employee list, probably starting in June. And really what we're trying to do there is to make sure that everybody that you have registered and working for you matches what we have registered for you on the revenue systems. And again, this is vitally important to ensure that from 1119, when the system goes live, that our data is correct. 
Um, we understand that the timelines for this implementation uh, are tight and you know it but we have been out there for the last year trying to get the message out there. We understand that it's not just a software challenge and that employers and revenue need to look at their current business processes and need to make sure that they'll be able to comply with the requirements from 1119. Readiness is challenging and we're doing our best to assist employers in terms of preparing for the changeover and to ensure that all of their data is fully aligned with the revenue systems before the system goes live. We do have a monthly external stakeholder steering meeting and um, a lot of the large representative bodies, employers, tax agents and practitioners attend that meeting and certainly we're using that meeting as um, a measure of how people are actually preparing and getting ready for the changeover from 1119. Just in terms of our own stakeholder engagement, I suppose the, the screenshot there is just to give you an idea of the types of um, engagement that we have um, fulfilled for 2017 and certainly we hope to continue that into 2018. We had quite a significant rollout with IPASS um, during November and December where we um, attended uh, 27 sessions with them in terms of making sure that people who are IPASS members are fully aware of what's coming down the line. You can see there from the snapshot um, that I've included there, we have quite a, a lot of events already scheduled in January and certainly even since I've put these slides together, uh, several more events have actually been signed up for. So I suppose just in terms of getting ready for PAYE modernization and the things that we would like you to do now, we want you to check that you're currently using the correct PPSN number for the employees that you have listed, making sure that they're all currently registered with revenue and making sure that you are operating from an up-to-date tax credit certificate for all of your employees. Making sure that you complete the P45 and P46 process for any employees who are commencing or have ceased working for you. And also having a look at your benefits and notional pay processes because now that things are changing to a monthly basis, you need to have a look at your BIK policies, particularly the CAR policies, and we would suggest that they should be reviewed now on a quarterly basis. And making sure that you're aware of your end of year duties as an employer. Um, I suppose they're the main steps that we would like you to look at initially. We will continue to provide updates on our own revenue.ie and um, if you want to go on there and have a look, it's on under employing people and there's a tab there with PAYE modernization. And there's certainly a significant amount of information available there to employers and employees. Um, we'll continue to have our monthly meetings and we have a dedicated email address if anybody wants to send us any direct questions or any feedback that you may have in terms of how the system and the project is progressing. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll pass you back over now to Vicky. Thanks for that, very informative. So we're just going to get set up for the question and answer session there. So we're just going to turn the webcam on. While we do that, we're just going to take a quick 30 second break. Um, if you do have any questions you'd like to ask the panel in that that time to just type in your questions there over in your control panel and we'll get through as many as we can so we're just going to just pop everything on pause there thank you okay I think we're back on air here uh, Vicky do you want to just maybe look at some of the questions that have come in yeah okay and um, so I'll just start at the very beginning um, so the payroll has to be amended for example a mistake has been made um, with overtime etc can an amended submission be made would you be better to, sub to submit only when you are reasonably sure that there'll be no further changes well if <clears throat> the overtime if this if you if you become aware of the overtime say in the following pay period and you're paying it then uh, that doesn't involve the correction submission I, I, I'm not exactly sure what the a few what do you think that question actually means I think you know, really it's saying if I think if it comes to light quite quickly that they haven't paid it over time and they're going to now pay it so okay. then that would be a correct so they change the payment I for think that. so yes yes yeah. yeah, sorry nine that, data they could, yeah. they would be able to change yeah that would be a correction if, if, if the payroll submission request has already gone in in respect to the payment without the overtime and then it's subsequently paid in that same week yes uh, a correction would need to be made 
Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, would a one-click system mean that there is less of a check and, balance, um, and balances system or audit trail? So would there be a means of checking the submissions before submitting them? From past experience, an educated payroll operator can spot when a P2C is incorrect before choosing to upload to software. Yeah, that's what it's, it's trying to get the balance. Um, you probably saw on the UK demonstration that uh, you know there were there were a couple of, there were a few clicks involved there because you actually had to select uh, the employees who the changes came in for, and you actually select them and then do the import or the import or process or whatever. Um, it's a balance whether we cut back on the number of clicks involved there. Um, we probably have it optional, maybe, and like that's a good point. Um, you try to maybe make it as user friendly as possible, but you, you do want to have more control over it as well. So yeah, it's something we will look at in, in, in terms of designing the, the Irish software. Thanks, Paul. Um, the UK uses specific tax codes for changes, but here we receive individual changes to credits. Will this be detailed on a report as it is now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so revenue apply interest to the employer, but it doesn't affect the employee, when essentially a correction could be due to lack of information from the employee themselves. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I suppose it, 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 the information not coming in from the employee is just in relation to their tax credits or whatever. I mean, this emergency would be applied if you don't have any information for that employee. Um, if you haven't sought an RPN, um, I yeah, I suppose the, the obligation rests with the employer to ensure that what they're returning is correct and I suppose that's something maybe that they need to look at if there's a delay in getting information from staff members, it's an internal business process change maybe that needs to be looked at or that's something it's tightened up in terms of how information is fed into the payroll um, department. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really sure. What else really we can do because the employer is required to return yeah, the correct I information. The moment, maybe sometimes you could have that they maybe didn't give the most recent P45 or something, yeah. but that would be elimination, elimination of the system. system. Yeah. Um, so really, I think between revenue and you know the checks that payroll software do, all of that should be eliminated. Really. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And um, do you have to request a revenue payroll notification before you can include a new starter on your payroll? It's uh, yeah. It's actually. The way the, the revenue payroll notification new system works, um, first, firstly, you do a, what's called a lookup RPN, which is for existing, um, you know, existing employees that revenue know that are on your on your payroll, um, and then there's, also, there's a new RPN request which relates to uh, new employees that have been taken on that revenue don't know you have, or they may know you have because the employee has been on the jobs and pensions uh, portal or whatever. But, um, sorry, I've forgotten what the question is. <laughs> sorry. It, it's really, I suppose, yeah. that it, it will actually feed into your system. So yes. if the person has already commenced their job with revenue, the information, when you go onto your payroll, the information will feed into your payroll system. Or you have the option of going in and actually looking up an RPM for that person before you pay them, depending on the type of software system that you're using. Uh, when I mention the two different types of RPN, I mean, this is not something you need to be concerned about yourself. The software will actually look after that in the background effectively. Yeah. And I assume then, obviously, if a, an employee hasn't just gone on through jobs and pensions and registered, uh, if you do the search for the RPN, then it will just come back and apply emergency. No, what will happen is once you put the person onto your payroll and give them a commencement date, that will trigger revenue to create an employment for that person. Okay. So that's where there won't be that, there shouldn't be the need for emergency. Okay. Thank you. So will the same dates apply for payments as for monthly P30? So file by the 15th but pay the 23rd. Okay, so will the revenue provide a specific date of the month when they will send the statement to the employer? It should be sent out, we're hoping for around the 5th of the month, but at the moment that actually that actual date hasn't been tied to, but in and around that period. It should issue at the beginning of the month and then they will have a period of time. As I've said, the return is due to be uh, the 14th with payment by the 23rd, so there's no change there. When you say sent out, you don't mean physically? You no, it could be through the yeah. yeah, into their email box. <clears throat> 
When I do my back return and if I am due a refund, I would offset the PLA impurity I against this. Will this still be possible under the new system? Yeah, offsets will still be possible and it's an area that we're currently looking at in terms of how that process will work. But yeah, offsets will be available. Okay, thank you. Um, any comments on, we just have a, a statement in here that the company does its wages once a year at the moment. They're going to have to change that. <laughs> process. Unless the employees unless, actually do physically get paid only Unless they only get paid once a year, yeah. they're going to have to change that process. Yeah, so I suppose some director's payrolls might be like that as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so a good few questions just coming in on the one record here. Just bear with me there. So what will happen where an employee record is set up and the employee does not start or starts on a different pay date? This is where there can be a high volume of temporary staff coming in and going. Um, we, where somebody comes in and you've set them up and then they don't start, the option that we're looking at is that you would put in the same date as their cessation date. So start and uh, cessation date will have the same date and that will tell us then that the person didn't actually commence. Um, if they're going to, if their commencement date changes, well then they can go in and correct that on the payroll in terms of the next payroll run or whatever, whenever they're going in to actually amend data. That's not going to really change anything because they won't have received any payment. I suppose from the employee's point of view as well, if they, if they start to work somewhere else, um, that other employer will request an RPN. A, an RPN for them. Now, I suppose a revenue note or thinks that they're working with another employer uh, it might be a zero. Okay. It might it might well be a zero and in that case then the individual would need to contact revenue directly because the employer is operating as per what we've issued to them because maybe of you know something that has been notified to them. So the individual will need to correspond with us. They'd also be able to do that through their my account. They will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and where, again, do that this, this is from the same person here, and where you're advised that an employee has left in a prior period, so maybe you've, on, you've had about a storm and then found out that they've left already, how will this be picked up by revenue? Um, that would be a correction. correction. For the submission, the same submission, yeah. submission, but with the with line the, item, with the lever with information. The cessation, yeah, with the cessation mm. details. Yeah. Okay. Just with regard to illness benefits, so where employers who pay in full or pay a top up, they need to receive notification of the taxable portion in real time and not go back to years past where you are, I suppose, estimating and then relying on the employee to submit information manually. Yeah, the illness benefit process has changed and we actually issued an employer's notice which details how they are to deal with that. So it might be useful if the individual with that question goes back and has a look at the employer notice because it does explain what should be taxed and how to tax it. So again, we're going to be capturing that data as part of the RPN that will issue. So the illness benefit portion will actually be taxed by a reduction in the tax credits when we receive that information. So it might be useful if they go back and just have a read of that employer's notice. Thanks, Sinead. Um, probably one for Paul. Um, where the payroll is run in the cloud and accessible from multiple PCs, how will this work with the auto link to retrieve and submit revenue information? Where the payroll is run, run in the cloud and accessed by multiple, you know, accessible from multiple PCs and multi-users, I guess. Well, I guess we don't actually have that. Or uh, like if somebody's running up on Dropbox, for example. Um, well, normally it would just be one user at the one t at any time. Um, but I, I don't really see an issue. Do you, what do you no, see? I think if they have, if they're able to access Ross at the minute, then there won't be any change there. They would still be able to, you know, they would still be able to submit to Ross. I would imagine. Yeah, that gets them in. Is that the, the question? Is though? Is it? I suppose it's how it's going to work with the retrieval, so in 2019, to retrieve your information. Yeah, well, I suppose as Audrey says, if the, um, if the digital certificate, the Ross digital cert, cert is on a particular machine, <coughs> and it's the valid one for that employer, um, the payroll will be able to access the RPNs on that machine. If there's another machine that has access to the same payroll, but there's no digital cert, they won't be able to do it. So I, I guess it's a case you need to copy the digital certs between the various machines. 
you can request additional digital certificates, can't you? So they may have that set up at the minute, but if not, they probably would need to. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, in a business which closes for the summer months, will it be okay for payroll to be run when reopening, as we do now, is there something needed to inform? Provided the employees are not receiving anything or any payments, yes, there's no problem with that. So, you know, we'll get nil um, returns in, but that's fine provided nobody is receiving any payments. So you won't estimate? No. If you don't receive anything for no. a month, you won't? Yeah. yeah. In the UK, there was a version of HMRC software available for small employers. Will the revenue be providing a similar facility here for calculation, or will it just be the ROS facility for submission of the payroll information? Yeah, we won't be providing any software or any facility to allow for calculation. It will simply be a template for people who are not using payroll software um, to actually fill in the amounts that they've calculated in respect of the payroll. Thank you. Um, I pay weekly, so does that mean I need to contact Revenue every week regarding every employee to let them know I'm going to pay them and what I'm going to pay them? Yes. Yeah, effective, but it, it is seamless. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's basically you're processing the payroll and it, you click the button and it'll, it'll submit the information to Revenue. So it's it's just part of the process that needs to be followed. Um, one, one, one further step, or like, like, like two further steps, you, you're also retrieving the RPNs. That's something you would be doing, I suppose, at the moment in terms of retrieving PGCs anyway. Um, so it's, it, it, should be, it should be a case that will save time for you because it cuts down on, particularly when, when you're retrieving P2Cs at the moment, it is quite, actually quite time consuming, or in fact, it will be a one or two click or whatever three click process now. Um, so it's not as bad as it, I don't think it's as bad as it, as it sounds. Um, the state will be fairly seamless, and hopefully, you know, as in the UK, uh, it actually rolled out fairly painlessly. I think yeah. um, and there were obviously issues with you know incorrect uh, H H more C thinking the liabilities were different to what the payroll thought. But hopefully, with the reconciliation service that Irish Revenue have those will be easy to reconcile anyway. Thanks, Paul. Um, this is just a follow-up to the question we had about whether we're only paying once a year. So the company does its wages once a year as the company only employs one person and the accountant does the wages. Does this mean I have to pay the accountant each week or month to do the wages now? Well, I don't know, unfortunately, if the employee is actually being paid every week, a, a submission has to go in every week. Um, so, you know, if, it, if it's straightforward, if it's very straightforward payroll, the same amount every week, I mean, hopefully your accountant won't be charging you too much. Mm -hmm. Any comments about what Sam saying you're in the business? And I suppose from our perspective, we're looking at those types of smaller employers and maybe having a facility whereby they know it's going to be a static amount every week that they'll be able to upload that information maybe at the beginning of the year or maybe twice a year depending on how that's going to actually look but I mean if they know it's static and there's not going to be any changes in terms of tax credits and rates etc we are looking at maybe allowing an option like that for the smaller employer. So they don't have to contact you then if something changed. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But so if, it, if it's changing, if it's changing you know, weekly, the amount then that's, that's being paid, that's not going you know, that's going to involve some big processing yeah. payroll weekly, so yeah. unfortunately, mm -hmm. at least for free. <laughs> the payroll software might be cheaper than the account. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. So in the UK, parent agents, I suppose, only receive notification of changes in tax codes. If there are none, we don't need to log on to check. Will this be the same with the Irish system, or will you have to log in each month before you process payroll to check? Well, when we say log, in, log on, I mean, it, it, it will be a very seamless process in that, um, I say, it's really one click uh, that will look up a uh, revenue system and will come back to you within a matter of seconds saying, okay, we've updated information or there's no information or whatever. Um, so it is something that has to be done each week. In the, in the UK, it's the same. I mean, I, I, it should be, yeah. yeah. They should always check. They sh yeah. should be a check every be week a, or every month. Yeah. To check, really. Um, um, will there be an increase in the annual cost of the payroll software with the source? 
No, it's that there's no intention to do that. In fact, we'll say it now. There is going to be no increase <laughs> as a result of PO modernisation. Keep the reporting. Yeah, over the next couple of years, we probably do a five yearly price increase uh, every five years, and I think that's probably 2020 is the next one we will be looking at. So it'll depend on the competitive market at the time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And will, will, will we receive new software from the source at the end of 2018? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, if, as the only person in a small company who prepares the payroll, I complete the payroll for the month in advance, as I will be on leave at month end when the staff are paid, but between the date I prepare the payroll and month end, there is a change in a staff member's tax credits, Will that require a change to the submission or will it be corrected when applied in the next payroll run? Realistically, if the person has been paid on the basis of what's on the payroll system, that's what they have physically been paid. Yeah. So, you know, it wouldn't catch up until the next pay period when the yeah. details are changed. And it wouldn't be looked upon as a, a revenue, a, a correction submission. A correction submission wouldn't be required in that case because the submission that originally went that's in correct. is reflecting what was actually paid. So it, 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 it's a correction within the payroll itself, but it doesn't require a separate correction submission to revenue. And revenue would probably see that that submission was sent in early before the OPM was issued on anyway. yeah. um, I don't know if you just want to just go over kind of the payment schedule as well. So someone's just asking here, so rather than four, four payments to revenue per year, there will now be 12. No, there's no change. If the person is a quarterly filer, they'll remain as a quarterly filer unless they opt to change themselves. So we're not changing the dates for payments or the payments uh, actual processes. Um, it's just that they have to actually notify us of the payroll information on a monthly basis. Okay, thanks, Janice. Or weekly. Or weekly, if they're paying <coughs> weekly, yeah. Um, if an employee works a week in lieu, when should you set the employee record up on payroll? Is it the week they start and then enter them as zero pay for that week or a week later? So basically when you're first paying them, what's kind of the correct procedure? Because well, actually it's, it's when they're paid yeah. is what counts for payroll. Um, so it's the week you start paying them that they really should be set up. We need to make sure that the start date is correct. So would a subsequent, like would a week two submission pick up a week one start date? Or do they need to be set up with the correct start date and a zero? Well, it, the RPN request will, will, will trigger, trigger the start date, start date. Yes, mm -hmm. that has been entered on the system. But if they don't receive anything in that first pay period, then that's not a problem. It's as yes. they're paid. So that'll be if it's the second week. Mm -hmm. That'll be fine. Thank you. Um, if a number of weeks are being cut up on, do we need to upload a PSR for each week or just the one? It's each week. That's the, that's the way the system will be set up. And it's, when you think about one of the objectives of the new system is, is employees being able to, to log into their My Account, their the revenue portal, so that they can see each of those weeks as separate amounts and separate deductions. So. It would have to be uh, individual week submissions that go up in order to facilitate that, that sort of information to be made available to the employees. Okay, and just the last question in there. Um, if a monthly staff member commences on the 15th of the month and the employer sets up the employee on the payroll on the 10th, the following month for payment on the 20th, will the Roth instruction be available on the day of setup of the employee on the payroll, so the 10th of the month? I was hoping she'd aim with you there. Monthly team member commences on the 15th of the month. So their commencement is put onto the payroll on the 15th. But they set up the payroll on the 10th of the, of the following month. month for payment on the 20th. Well, as soon as they put them on the payroll, the information will be available. Like as soon as they, once an RPM request, once an goes, RPM request there, goes, the information is going to be there. So by the time the payment on the 20th happens, it should actually all be in the system, shouldn't it? Yeah, and I think yeah. I think in that case, the, the RPN request wouldn't actually go in until the 20th, something that should be yeah. paid itself. Um, so that will that'll include the start date that has been entered mm -hmm. on the system. 
and uh, but does it sound like it's being processed that the payroll is being processed on the 10th of the month as opposed to the actual payment being made on the 10th or did I read clear it says the employer sets up the employee on the payroll on the 10th of the following month for payment on the 20th yes and so that's just when they do just their payroll the and they yeah, run up to the exactly. 20th yeah yeah Okay, so they're logging it on the tent, notifying that somebody started the previous 20, 15th of the previous, previous month. month. So on the 10th of February, you're saying that you started on the 15th of January, mm -hmm. and you're processing the payment at that stage yeah. then, so you're requesting an OPM, which is you say you're going to get back anyway. Yeah, the payment on the 20th. Okay, and just a few more questions have just come in there, actually. Um, <coughs> Just to note redirectors payroll, in the UK there are many one and two directors payrolls that we process just once a year. I understand that the directors are paid from a director's loan account each month, but when the annual salary is processed at the end of the year, the adjustments are then made so that it is paid as a salary. It may help some of the payrolls that have director-only payrolls. We only submit one annual full payment submission in the UK and have never had any issues, just thought I'd mention it. That's a fair point. And I suppose just to mention as well that the, the system is slightly different. Uh, it's different between the UK and Ireland. In the UK, uh, the FPS is more interested with year-to-date figures, and um, where in Ireland, they're looking for periodic figures. And again, I suppose that's more to facilitate this, this concept of the employee port and the, maybe see these paying deduction statements for each pay period. In the UK, they don't have that facility. Um, but the point of making is that you know in the UK they can receive just one, uh, say yearly, FPS, and they're fine with that because they have all the details they need uh, forever, forever, for levying liability. Whereas in Ireland, um, they generally would need the periodic information. So the, the periodic one on in week 52 for the director would have to contain the full year's details, yeah. as if it's all being paid in that one period. So, yeah, this was a little bit of a session earlier, mentioned earlier on, yeah. this bedding down of this, this new system, which will probably take a couple of years, I would imagine. Um, just a query and just from a the school there. So the school admin team work throughout the summer and continue to be paid weekly via the bank. However, the payroll needs to be authorised prior to the summer. Currently, the payroll is run in advance to facilitate this and weekly bank payments scheduled and authorised. When and how should we do the submissions? Before they close up for the summer, they can yeah. send all of the submissions. Send it all in at once. There's no problem. It's on or before, so yeah. that would be the correct way to do it. Yeah. Can you be too soon or not? Will there be a, a um, limit? On not really, advance, not because if they've calculated it and they've you know, worked out the payroll, they know that the person is going to be paid X, then that's absolutely fine. And then they've obviously scheduled the bank payments to happen at that time as well. So there's no yeah. problem. So the notifications is obviously going to have what well, that's week number twenty seven, exactly. week number twenty eight, yeah, week number twenty nine. Exactly. So as you say, there's no issue once it's on before the actual yeah. date that the payment is leaving the bank. Um, there's a change in their tax credits during that period, which they're not, they're obviously not going to be uh, picked, picked up. up. Picked up yeah. Yeah, it, It'll be corrected in the next yeah. live payroll mm -hmm. run, for want to be better it's words, when they actually are back open and back in, okay. you know, putting yeah. in the new payroll. <coughs> and again, they'll have operated based on the RPN that was present at that time, so it's not going to be a problem. Okay. Um, once you've signed the variable direct debit mandate, will revenue automatically initiate the payments monthly? The direct debit and variable direct debit is still something that we haven't fully finalised in terms of how that process is actually going to work. So as soon as we have that um, agreed, we'll be back to you with how it's actually going to work. But I would envisage, as is with the direct debit that's there at the moment, that revenue will initiate payment once the return has been received and filed. Thank you. And if part of your income is from self-employment, can you allocate some of your tax credits towards it? Um, at the moment, that facility is not available, although where people do their end-of-year return, we do allow some of it to be um, paid using their tax credits for the next year. But it's something that we have 
looked at and something that we're considering, but I'm not sure it could be part of the initial rollout for PAYE modernization. Okay, um, I think we probably just answered this, but no harm in just kind of clarifying. Um, I work part time one day a week for a company and do the payroll on that day, which may be several days before the pay date. Will that matter? No, they can upload it at that time once they have completed. Okay, and if I take holidays, the payroll would not be done until after I come back. Will the company be penalised for that? If the people are paid while you're gone on holidays, yes. But if they're not until you come back, well then there's no issues. Thank you. Well, for Paul or Audrey, will net to gross the SOARS calculation still be available for 2019? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, because we, we work the net to gross calculation off the, the P2C figures that you have. Um, so yeah, it will be it will be available. And I would always recommend that it's probably not the best idea to do net to gross because it can end up being quite costly, particularly if you agreed with employees to pay them a certain amount net. Uh, once there's adverse changes to their tax credits, it could be very uh, costly for you. Okay, so that's all the questions in there. We just have one final one, just um, just somebody just inquiring about the handouts there that we mentioned earlier. Um, I think after the webinar, we'll be sending everything on, copy of the webinar, etc. We just need to just get that ready for you, but yeah, they'll be on their way to you as well. So that's all okay. the questions in. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank everybody. you very thank much you for joining us. And thank you, Sinead.